was reading, do any of you read Jim Dennison's piece? Any of you read Jim Dennison? Oh, you ought to go on. The Dennison Forum, it's free. Every morning he has a blurb out that is very, very powerful. Here's what Jim said today. He's a Baptist pastor from, from down in Texas. He said, I believe God wants us to see the problems of our day as our responsibility since we are the salt and light in a decaying, dark world. He said, it's our job to take the transforming light of Christ to those who need it most. And then Jim went on to say, help hurting people to show them God's love. And remember, the darker the room, the more powerful the light. So I would ask you to just think what I want to say tonight. How or where will, will you, uh, if you're touched, uh, serve? Many of you know the words of the song, The Boxer, that Simon and Garfunkel sang in Central Park. It says, man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And there are the cries, the cries of the persecuted that we in the West and we in the church are refusing to hear. The Bible has much to say about persecution, oppression, and ultimately freedom. In Luke 4, 18, 19, Jesus is reading from Isaiah at the synagogue in Nazareth and says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. In Ecclesiastes 4.1, which is so powerful, it says, Again, I looked. I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. I stand before you tonight with a grave and a growing sense of urgency regarding the erosion of religious liberty at home and abroad. All over the world, people of faith are denied the fundamental and inalienable human right to confess and express their faith according to the dictates of their conscience. According to the Pew polling data, 80% of, of the world's population going up every year lives in a religiously repressive nation at this very moment that we are here. 80%, that would be roughly 6.5 billion people. America's first freedom, religious freedom, has never been under more assault both at home and abroad than it is today. The task, I believe, is urgent. The stakes are high. I think what remains to be seen is whether the people of God will rise to the occasion for such a time as this. Throughout my career, I have borne witness to the tragic state of religious persecution that is a daily reality for so many people over the world, the places that I've traveled. The last couple of years we've been in Nigeria, in northern Iraq, and many of those other places. All to me, freedom of religion and belief is a bellwether for other cherished freedoms. Where this first freedom is compromised, all human rights are under assault. And although, and I won't talk about it tonight, there are some disturbing trends regarding religious freedom in our country, and some of you may face things that my generation never had to face, they are small. They are very small in nature compared to what is taking place to people of faith around the world in China, in Nigeria, in the Middle East, and places like that. From China to Iran to Egypt, from Pakistan to Vietnam to India to North Korea, the face of repression varies, but the outcome is the same. Harassment, fear, imprisonment, and even death, simply because of what a person believes. In country after country, freedom of religion is indeed compromised. And Christians, to borrow a phrase from history, are in the eye of the gathering storm. And that is perhaps no more truer than in the Middle East. This reality hit home on a number of trips I've taken over the last couple of years to northern Iraq. We went with the aim of reporting on the plight of the Iraqi Christians and the religious minorities, including 
the, the Yazidis. The, the Yazidis have suffered, perhaps, more than any other group. It is genocide. The previous administration called it genocide. The Congress called it genocide against both Christians and, and, and Yazidis, thousands of whom were displaced during the Islamic march across northern Iraq. We saw the swift and the largely unanticipated rise uh, of ISIS. In a matter of days, the Iraqi cities of Mosul and Tikrit fell. Unspeakable brutality followed. A caliphate, a caliphate was declared. Christians were told to leave, and if they didn't leave, to pay a tax or die. And Yazidi men were killed, and Yazidi women and children were bought, sold, and raped. When we were in Sinjar, in Sinjar City, we saw mass graves that have not been excavated of, of Yazidi men. We met with many young Yazidi women and girls who told us the brutal stories that it was almost hard to believe. And even at this very moment, there are 2,500 to 3,000 Yazidi women who are still alive, still with ISIS, and have not been returned. It's worth noting the rich biblical heritage contained in these lands. With the exception of Israel, the Bible contains more references to the cities and regions and nations of ancient Iraq than any other country in the world. The first time I went there, when the war broke out, we slipped in and I went to a town called, called Nasiriyah. And I went up to the, the barbed wire and I showed the Marines my ID. And he brought us in and the, the commander said, you know where you are? You're in Ur. This is the site of, of Abraham. Abraham was from Iraq. Isaac's bride, Rebecca, came from northwest Iraq. Jacob spent 20 years in Iraq, and his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, were born either in northwest Iraq or actually right on the border. In those days, they didn't have the defined borders that they have now. A remarkable spiritual revival, as told in the book of Jonah, occurred in Nineveh, present-day Mosul. And ISIS, four and a half years ago, blew up Jonah's tomb, blew up Jonah's tomb, and there was not almost a word from the West, nor was there a word from the Christian community in the West. The ancient account of Daniel, the great man of the Bible, in the lion's den took place in Iraq. And both Daniel and Ezekiel are buried in Iraq. Today, Abraham would have a difficult time surviving in Iraq. Jonah would be hard pressed to make it to Nineveh. And a phrase not often heard outside the Middle East is first the Saudi people and then the Sunni people. The Jewish community in Iraq numbered 150,000, 150,000 in 1948. When I was there, I said, how many Jewish people are left? And they said, Mr. Wolf, maybe, maybe four. Maybe, maybe four. And then maybe, maybe none. In Egypt, the Jewish population was once as many as 80,000, and now roughly 20 individuals when I was there several years ago, we met with the, the leader of the Jewish community. She said, Mr. Wolf, we're all old. I said, how many? She said, maybe 20 more or less, and that was several years ago, so it is now under 20. In 2003, Iraq's Christian population numbered 1.5 million. Today, roughly 250,000 remain, and maybe even less. Some fled the neighboring countries, including Syria, only to be uprooted once again in the current bloody conflict. Others emigrated to the West. I will say, I think the Trump administration, particularly Vice President Pence, has done an outstanding job of directing aid to the Christians and to the Yazidis when they had been forgotten about before this time. To a person, when asked, every Christian we met with in Iraq expressed a pervasive sense of abandonment. They can't understand why the West is silent. They can't understand why the church in the West is silent. These courageous men and women of faith, and their faith is stronger. When I take trips and go to these places, my faith is enriched and strengthened by being with people like this. These courageous men and women can't understand why the burning of churches, forced conversions, the emergence of a caliphate in the cradle of Christendom 
was not being met with urgency and action by fellow believers in, in the West. After the Islamic State seized Mosul, one Christian husband we met with attempted to take his wife of 28 years to Mosul so she could continue to receive treatment for breast cancer. When they arrived at the hospital in Mosul, they were met by an ISIS guard who refused to allow them entrance because they were Christian. They were told that the price for entrance and medical treatment was conversion to Islam. The wife refused. The couple, a construction worker, and his wife then returned to their small village about 16 miles away. Ten days later, we found that she passed away with her husband and two of her sons with her. We asked the husband, who was now living in a broken down classroom in a cold, brutal environment, what, what, what did he remember his wife had said? He said, these were the words that she said. She said, I'm going to hold on to the cross of Christ. She said, I refuse to convert. She said, I prefer death. She said, I prefer death to abandoning my religion and my faith. She was 45. Now, in the Bible, we know that Peter, Peter denied Christ three times. Peter saw Jesus many, many times. Peter ate with Jesus. Peter saw Jesus walk on the Sea of Galilee, yet he denied Christ, and he had a construction worker, and his wife would not deny Christ, and as a result of that, uh, she ended up dying. In Nigeria, where we're working and trying to encourage this administration to do something bold to really saving, to keep your minds to think about this, ISIS killed so many people. Boko Haram in Nigeria killed more people. So Boko Haram, which is in Nigeria, has killed more Christians and more non-Christians and more people in Nigeria than ISIS has killed in Iraq and Syria combined. In April 2014, Boko Haram garnered the worldwide attention for kidnapping 276 Christian girls, the Chabak girls. I met with uh, some of the parents. I won't tell you what they're telling the parents. We brought one of the mothers over uh, last, last year. And the mother said, we were so excited because if you remember hashtag, bring back the girls, does anybody remember that? Hashtag, bring back the girls. All the world leaders did hashtag, bring back the world. And the mother said, we were so we were so excited to see that because the world really, really, really cared. 45% of the girls have not come back. This past April, which was five years, no one, no world leader, no religious leader, no one did hashtag bring back the girls. The girls have been forgotten. Five years later, more than 100 girls are still missing and all but forgotten. And in a more recent event, and I urge you to go online and look at it, Leah Sherabu was among a group of girls kidnapped by Boko Haram two years ago. Boko Haram released all the girls who professed to embrace Islam. Leah, age 14, Leah, age 14, refused to renounce her faith and is now held as a slave by Boko Haram. Here's a 14-year-old girl who offered to be released from one of the most dangerous, second dangerous terrorist groups in the world, refuses to deny her faith and still is a captive. Go online, Leah, Leah Sherabu, Nigeria. And there was almost no, you never see it in the Western media and I haven't seen any Christian leaders in the West mention it. We had her mother over uh, three, three months ago, and 14, now 16. In China, we see religious persecution of every faith, Christians, Catholics, Congressman Chris Smith took Holy Communion from Bishop Sue, who's never been seen since. Protestants, 
taking down crosses, arresting Protestant pastors, Muslim, Falun Gong, and we see what's taking place in Hong Kong. It's the worst in China that has ever been since Mao's days. Every church, Catholic, Protestant, pastors, just destroyed. I slipped in several years ago to Tibet with a young Buddhist monk and nun. I dressed as a trekker and went in with a, with a trekking group. Every monastery in Tibet has a camera coming down and watching. Every monastery in Tibet has the public security police monitoring what takes on. In the last several years, 130 to 140 Buddhist monks and nuns have poured kerosene on their bodies, lit a match, self-emulate. One just did it two or three days ago to protest, and the world almost says nothing. Three million, this is hard to believe, three million Uyghurs, Muslims, are now in, in, in detention camps modeled after Mao and after the Nazis. I would ask you to go, go on ABC, Uyghurs, and look at the picture show, Uyghurs coming off of trains, and I'm gonna show you a movie here, coming off of trains, handcuffed like this, blind, blindfolded. We meet with the Uyghur families, and I'll tell you what's going on. There's a friend of mine, Reba Kadir, who, who is a Uyghur grandmother. 33 of her grandchildren are in these detention camps. And up until about two or three weeks ago, the world said almost, almost nothing. The Falun Gong are facing severe persecution. They are now, if you look at the Freedom House studies, they're now going in and arresting the Falun Gong and taking their blood type. And then for sixty to seventy-five thousand dollars, a Westerner can go to China, stay in a three-star ho hotel. They take your blood type and they match it, and in a few days you get a new kidney. You get a new kidney because they're killing the Falun Gong, and they're using their kidneys. There's, if you go online and see, two weeks ago there was a daughter who found her father in a freezer, still alive. They did it because the sooner the organ is donated and transplanted the greater it takes, and yet the world has been relatively silent. We have on college campuses, you have, there's several in the state of Virginia. Do you all know about the Confucius Institutes? Does it, do you know what they are? They won't allow a Catholic priest to come in. They won't allow a Protestant pastor from China to come in. They won't allow a Dalai Lama to come in. They won't allow the Falun Gong to come in. They won't allow a Uyghur mother or father to, to come in, and yet they're on college campuses, even here in the state of Virginia. And if you look at it, go on Google and look at it. Director Ray of the FBI said they're spying operations, and they're spying on the Chinese students who come here. And the West, fortunately, 20 schools have now kicked them off. Penn State has kicked them off. University of Chicago kicked them off. But there are still some schools in this state that still have it whereby a Catholic priest, a Protestant pastor, a Buddhist monk, a Uyghur, a Falun Gong could not come, come in. We see there is growing anti-Semitism around the world and even here in the United States. There are Jewish students on colleges here in America who fear and are facing anti-Semitism. This whole BDS, boycott, divestiture and sanction is a soft form of anti-Semitism. And so we see anti-Semitism growing around the world, but, but even, even here in the United States. Should we not today be burdened by the great injustice of religious persecution taking place around the world? Those who are persecuted can, can seem distant from our halls of government, from our churches and universities and mosques and synagogues, but these people, they yearn for our prayers and they cry out for our attention. Every time I go in, when we leave them, whether it be in China or whether it be in Africa, we say, what can we do for you? And the first thing they say, they say, pray, pray for us. For me, as a follower of Jesus, Scripture gives me little choice if I want to follow the scripture, but to respond to the oppression. 
the book of Hebrews enjoins us to, quote, remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners. I mean, that, that's, that's not in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about religious freedom. That's in the Bible. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who were mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The Old Testament book of Isaiah says, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise into darkness and your night will become like the noonday. I'm convinced that as those being persecuted become more than faceless, nameless victims in distant wars and hard to pronounce prison cells, and as we commit to knowing their stories, weeping at their wounds, and interceding on their behalf through prayer and advocacy, that we will find ourselves shaped by these men and women. In, in America, I, I, I believe we need more Dietrich Bonhoeffers. I think we need more Martin Luther Kings. I would also urge all of you, if you haven't read it, or if you had, it's been a while, read Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. It is a mandate for what we should be doing. We need more Thomas, Thomas Moores, and we need more William Wilberforces. What remains to be seen is whether men and women of faith and others of goodwill will accept this challenge regardless of where it leads them. When asked why he continually spoke out against injustice, Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor Ellie Wiesel said, quote, if I remain silent, I may help my own soul, but because I do not help other people, I poison my soul Silence, he said, never helps the victim. It only helps the victimizers. Ellie was, I was right. What, what, what a parable is it? Silence never, never helps the victim. It only helps the victimizer. In fact, silence actually encourages the wrongdoers to continue their act of violence. Martin Luther, the great theologian, said, we are responsible for what we say, and we are responsible for what we do not say. We look what's taking place in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, I've, I've met some of those students. They're 17 years old. Jonathan Wong is 17 years old. He's now 21, but he, but he started. If you, if, if you get a chance, go on the Netflix and look at the Netflix. Jonathan, they are literally bringing the Chinese government down. Almost all of the students in Hong Kong, if you've been seeing, they've been waving the flags, the American flags, and they've been singing the song from Les Mis at the barricades. They're all Christian students, and they're not afraid. They're standing up to one of the most powerful, powerful governments, but they're really making a difference. I personally would love to see the college campuses aflame with Joshua Wong's and people that we now see in Hong Kong. In the 18th century, British parliamentarian William Wilberforce said this to his fellow countrymen about the evils of the trade, trade, slave trade. Wilberforce said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say again that you do not know. So we know, we are on the internet, you can Google everything I told you, we can never again say that we do not know of the persecution of the people taking place all over the world. And Dr. Martin Luther King, as I told you, I urge you to read his letter from a Birmingham jail, said, in the end, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. So are not we the friend of the persecuted? So if we consider ourselves to follow the teachings of Christ, that we will be the friends of the persecuted. And therefore, we will need to pray, and we will need to speak, and then we will need to act. We will need to do something. That's it. Let me take your questions, and then I want to show you a wrap-up film. This sort of covers where we are. Yes, ma'am.
Did I see a hand back there? Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little? Yeah. Why is there a rise in oppression and struggle with depression? And what can we as college students learn from this outcome? One, I'll, I'll ask the second. You, you, all, you, you could do so much. You all have so much power. It is unbelievable. If I can marshal, if we could just get, you know, before I be, I said, Lord, when I get out, I said, Lord, I pray that I touch one kid in this audience, or maybe five, or maybe ten. You all could make a tremendous difference. Joshua, uh, Joshua is 17. You could bring things down. You could change, change things. There are American companies that are selling technology to the Chinese to watch the Uyghur Muslims. They're selling cameras. They're selling artificial intelligence devices. We, you could, we're trying to urge a group of, uh, of lawyers in town to sue them, to go after them. There are American law firms with prominent former congressmen and senators that are now out with big law firms that are representing the Chinese. How do you go home at night and tell you what your kids, what you're doing when you're representing the Chinese, when they're taking Muslim kids away to detention camps, killing Catholic bishops, tearing down crosses, taking the Falun Gong's kidneys out? There's a lot. So you can go after some of those big law firms that are in the city. Prominent Republicans, prominent Democrats that are working, working for, there is so much that you can, you, you can do. I mean, I'll tell you, a student movement, and I urge you to look at the Netflix thing of Joshua Wong, they are literally, they, they, they have the government of China tied up in, in knots. So if this group wanted to do something, you can make, make a tremendous difference. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna create a problem for anybody here, but it's, it's Young lady who was just here left, and she's with IJM. She said, well, what can we do? I was with IJM. I helped him when, when he got started. My best friend in Congress was a Democratic member, Congressman Tony Hall. We were kind of on the beginning to help IJM. Well, my church is involved, and I go to different things. I'm going around our college campuses, and I, I go to the IJM meetings, and I, I mean this respectfully. I think IJM is a great group. But you know what else they could, they could do? They could go pick it. They could go pick at the places where women and girls are sexually trafficked. I asked Polaris, a group in Northern Virginia, that when I left Congress, I gave some of my campaign money for. They had the hotline to find some places. They found 81 places in Northern Virginia. I sent some of my staff out to take pictures. We took them to the pick at them. Do you think if there were a sexually trafficked place and a group of students stood outside and picket it, do you think anybody would go in? Or another thing they could do, they could go to the Virginia General Assembly. They could say, would you pass a bill that says that we, when we go in a place and seize a place where women and girls are sexually trafficked, we can sell the building and we can give the money for rehabilitation for the women and the girls that are sexually trafficked. You all have the power to make, you literally have the power to change this country on issues like this.